Hi, I'm Logan Medish, host of the High Caliber History Podcast, and today we're going to be talking about Confederate revolver manufacturing during the Civil War. If that's something you think would interest a friend of yours, make sure you share this with them, and be sure to stay tuned for the whole episode. And without further ado, let's get on into it. So when dealing with Confederate manufacturing of revolvers, it's a, a wide variety of things that fascinate me about this topic and this concept. And part of it is the vast number of different manufacturing firms that were making the guns um, and, and why they were making them and why they were making the specific types of guns that they were making. Uh, there's a lot that went into their different designs and a lot of ingenuity that they had to come up with um, because they didn't necessarily always have all the equipment or the raw materials that they needed. So we're going to take a look at a handful of different manufacturing firms of these guns during the war. I'm going to go through them in, in no particular order. It's not alphabetical. It's not, uh, not any preference to them. Uh, and the information on some will be shorter than the others just because they were either in business for a shorter period of time or there's just very little written about them, which unfortunately is something that we see. So for starters, we're going to deal with an individual by the name of Thomas Kofer. And guns made by this Portsmouth, Virginia-based gunsmith are some of the rarest examples of all Confederate revolvers. Uh, his design was based on the Whitney Navy, and estimates put production somewhere between just 86 and 140 guns. Uh, not a whole lot here, and less than 10 are known to exist today. Now, the biggest visual distinction between a Whitney and a Kofer revolver is that Kofer's guns feature a spur trigger with no trigger guard, whereas the Whitney guns had both a trigger and guard in the traditional sense. Now, Thomas Kofer's introduction to gunsmithing came about before the Civil War, and it was in the form of an apprenticeship to his cousin by the name of Pembroke Gwaltney. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great name uh, as an aside. Um, and Pembroke Gwaltney was already an established gunsmith, and so he brought Kofer under his wing and was teaching him. Sometime before 1861, with the breakout of the Civil War, uh, Kofer had branched out onto his own and gone into business for himself as an arms manufacturer. Uh, well, manufacturer, sort of. Uh, initially, an arms importer, and we'll get into uh, the odd distinction there. But so, first, as, as an importer, some of the earliest Kofer marked guns are shotguns that uh, bear his name on either the barrel of the gun or on the lock plate of the gun. There's only a handful of those that uh, are in existence or that are known to exist. And I've had the opportunity to handle one of them, which was really quite remarkable. Um, I, I handled it while it was still within the ownership of the original family. Uh, and the descendant was, uh, they were descendants of a member of Mosby's Rangers during the Civil War. Now, that particular example um, I thought was pretty neat because even though Kofer didn't make the guns himself, uh, he seemed to still be pretty proud of those pieces because the one that I held had his name and a floral design on the barrel that was very elaborate and even highlighted in gold leaf which is not something you necessarily see in terms of an import mark on a gun. Uh, despite having relatively little formal education, Tom Kofer has the distinction of holding one of the first patents issued by the Confederate States of America. His patent, the ninth one issued by the CSA, was for a revolver with a board through cylinder that successfully evaded Rollin White's patent held by Smith & Wesson. The drawing he submitted with the patent application shows a revolver that looks very different from a Whitney Navy. Now, why he chose to abandon the design from the patent drawing is unknown. The patent document itself is actually very important because it is the only known surviving document, uh, surviving patent document issued by the Confederacy. Now, Kofer's guns uh, fired metallic cartridges 
that had thimbles at the rear of them designed to fit down into the cylinder channel uh, created by the removal of the percussion cones. A separate plate was fitted to the back of the cylinder uh, to which the percussion caps are seated on the relocated cones. There were three distinct types of guns that he made. The first model utilized a cylinder that only fired his patented metallic cartridges. The second model was designed to function either with his patented cylinder or the more conventional percussion cylinder. And the third model utilized only a percussion cylinder and had an added shoulder to fill the space between the barrel and the cylinder that existed in the absence of his special cylinder. So he had to make an adaptation for it to fire in the most conventional percussion manner. A government order for just 82 of his revolvers was completed and delivered by Kofer in May of 1862. And this was his one and only contract with the Confederate government. And all of those guns are noted as having been delivered to the 5th Virginia Cavalry. By January of 1864, Kofer's property in Portsmouth, Virginia had been seized by the Marshal of the United States and was sold at auction to Samuel Friedley of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Kofer then relocated to Richmond, Virginia, and worked at the Confederate arsenal there until the end of the war in 1865. He and his family returned to Portsmouth after the war, and he was able to buy back his home, and he resumed work as a gunsmith for another 20 years until July of 1885, when he died at just 57 years old. All right, so now we've talked about Kofer. Let's move on to one of the more well-known uh, firms was J.H. Dance and Brothers out of Texas. Uh, the guns made by this firm are some of the most distinct to come out of the Civil War, uh, but they differ in a very important and immediately recognizable aspect of appearance. And that's the fact that Dance revolvers lack a recoil shield on both sides of the frame. So it gives the frame a very flat look, which makes them easy to identify at a gun show or in a historic photo, such as one that circulates uh, of Native American Geronimo, who is holding a dance revolver um, as late as 1890. James Henry Dance, for whom the company is named, uh, he and his brothers were descended from a Revolutionary War color bearer who served directly under General George Washington. The family originated in Virginia, and then they migrated to North Carolina and then to Alabama, where they stayed until James left and headed to Texas in the early 1850s. About a year later, his three brothers, two sisters, and a cousin joined him, where they purchased some 900 acres and opened a machine shop and a lumber mill, which was located across the street from the family home that they'd purchased in 1858. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, all of the male family members enlisted with the Confederacy, serving with the 35th Texas Cavalry Browns Regiment. Because revolvers were in such high demand, many newspaper editors, such as the one at Houston's Tri-Weekly Telegraph, noted that, quote, However much we want men in the field, it is certain good and well-skilled mechanics in pistol factories are worth ten times as much as in the field, end quote. Eventually, Texas Governor Francis Lubbock gave in and exempted the dance factory workers from military service. This included the dance brothers George Perry Dance, David Ethelred Dance, and Isaac Claudius Dance, as well as their cousin Harrison Perry. Now, James Henry Dance was a lieutenant, and he stayed with the cavalry. All told, 35 soldiers were detailed to the dance factory, 23 of which uh, came from the 35th Texas Cavalry Browns Regiment. Production on the revolvers began uh, in 1862 in East Columbia, Texas, with the first guns being completed there by mid-July. Many contemporaries believe dance revolvers to have been a superior design to any others on the market. In fact, in the September 5, 1862 edition of the Houston Tri-Weekly Telegraph, the editors called the guns, quote, superior to Colt's best. They will kill a Yankee every pop unless you hit him in the conscience, which is ball proof, <laughs> which is kind of funny there. Uh, now, the exact number of J.H. Danson Brothers revolvers made is unknown. Estimates put it somewhere between 325 and 500 guns. 
Visual cues, such as the lack of the recoil shield, have been used to identify their guns because none have ever surfaced bearing the dance name. They're all unmarked. Other tips to identify the dance include the rather square, thick, and heavy trigger guards and the larger-than-average dies used to mark the serial numbers. On that note, not all of the guns have serial numbers. Some of them have been observed with shapes instead, such as diamonds um, or a combination of numerals uh, and shapes. But no matter what the serial markings, you can expect to find them on just about every single part. Now, they didn't miss a beat. They put them on the cylinder, the hammer, the loading lever, the triple juncture of barrel frame and trigger guard, and so on and so forth. So the markings might have been a little unusual, but they were everywhere. The majority of the guns Dance produced were in 44 caliber, with their overall length being the same as a Colt Dragoon, but the cylinder matches that of an 1860 Army and not a Dragoon. As a result, the barrels, which have seven lands and grooves with a clockwise spin and no gain to the twist, are actually longer than the ones seen on a Dragoon revolver. They also produced some 36 caliber models, which made them the only company to have produced both calibers for the Confederacy. It's long been held that the company's decision to relocate to Anderson, Texas, was to avoid being shelled by gunboats on the Brazos River. While that may be true, it's also largely due in part to the company having been purchased by the Confederate government, which just so happened to have an ordinance works in Anderson, Texas. Acquisition of the company likely happened in early 1864, but it took some time to coordinate getting everything ready to go back into production. On June 16th, 1864, James Henry Dance was given leave to go, quote, to Anderson for the purpose of settling with Captain Good for machinery sold to government, end quote. Production resumed that same month, with the final record of production being just 46 guns on June 6th. On April 5th, 1865, just four days before Lee surrenders at Appomattox, there was a sales receipt for one final pistol to an officer who was stationed at the Ordnance Works in Anderson, Texas. With the war over, the male members of the Dance family went back to their peacetime professions. The family legacy still looms large there. Uh, the diehard enthusiasts can still make a pilgrimage of sorts to where the Dance factory uh, and undertakings were located. The home that they purchased in 1858 was occupied continuously by members of the family until 1908, and it's still a beautiful home, and there is a plaque out front that discusses the history and importance of the house. The machine shop and lumber mill that was located directly across the street was destroyed by a storm in 1900. Nothing remains there but some nondescript brick foundations and a plaque noting its former location. The guns made by the Dance Brothers are highly prized by collectors, with examples selling oftentimes uh, in the six figures. One should exhibit extreme caution when considering purchasing a supposed original Dance, especially the rarer 36 caliber version, uh, because many fakes have been made by grinding off the recoil shield on Colt revolvers. Um, but that's not always uh, the easiest way to identify a possible fake, uh, but just by judging the 36 caliber, because even though they are rare, there were at least three 36 caliber and one 44 caliber dance revolvers that have been verified as genuine dance guns that have recoil shields. So, uh, it's uh, it's definitely a little bit complicated when it comes to the Dance Brothers, and if you're going to plunk down a serious chunk of change on one of them, you might want to have it looked at by uh, one or two or more uh, well-known collectors. If you are listening to this and you happen to find yourself in that situation and are wondering who are these collectors, well, uh, get a hold of me and I will be happy to put you in touch with some of the Confederate revolver experts that I know. Now, talking back about the house and the location of the factory in East Columbia, Texas, uh, the, the town itself is just a tiny dot on the map, and there's fewer than 100 residents there today, but it's definitely rich in history. Uh, it's the only town in Texas that can claim that Stephen F. Austin, Sam Houston, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, and many other Texas notables 
walk the streets. So even though it's a tiny town, uh, there's there's big history there, and, and the Dance family still looms large. All right, moving on to Griswold and Gunnison. Before the Civil War, Samuel Griswold was a successful businessman, and he had found a good living making cotton gins. Business was so good, in fact, that he managed to purchase 4,000 acres outside of Macon, Georgia, where he established and named a town for himself, Griswoldville, Georgia. Arvin Gunnison had worked for Griswold many years before the war started. He was a trusted employee uh, and was likely the person who was in charge of the actual production at the factory. So Griswold would have handled the financial side of things and Gunnison would have handled the technical side of things. Unfortunately, beyond this, uh, there's very little known about Gunnison on a personal level. With Southern weaponry in short supply, Griswold and Gunnison first entered the arms business in February of 1862 when they answered the call of Georgia's Governor Brown by making pikes. Soon, they branched out and excelled in the revolver market. Their production numbers were unrivaled in the South, as were the quality of their guns. Unfortunately, production ended abruptly on November 20th, 1864, when Captain Frederick Ladd and the 9th Michigan Volunteer Cavalry Regiment burned the town of Griswoldville. That began the most infamous General Sherman's March to the Sea. Examples of Griswold and Gunnison revolvers can be spotted by their brass frame with a slightly upward angle of the butt profile and the twist lines on the cylinder caused by its manufacture from twisted iron instead of steel. About 3,700 of these six-shot revolvers were produced during the two-year period between 1862 and 1864. The 36 caliber guns were based on the Colt Model 1851 Navy, but with a barrel assembly that looked more like the ones on a Dragoon than on a 51 Navy. Moving on to another uh, firm by the name of Spiller and Burr. The Spiller and Burr factory was originally established in Richmond, Virginia, as the brainchild of wealthy businessmen Edward Spiller uh, and David Burr, and they were working in conjunction with firearms expert James Burton. So Spiller and Burr were the, the financial backing, and Burton was the, the gun brains behind it. Uh, Burr was a Southern simplifier, uh, running a commission business in Baltimore, Maryland, and Spiller was born and raised in Richmond, where he made steam engines and locomotives before the war. Burton had worked at Harper's Ferry Arsenal, Hall's Rifle Works, Ames Manufacturing, and the Royal Small Arms Manufactory. He was also a lieutenant colonel in the Confederate Army and held the role of superintendent of armories for the Bureau of Ordnance. So it was quite the combination of individuals there. They certainly had the know-how and they certainly had the money. The Richmond factory moved south in 1862 because Burton had set up, uh, he had been directed to set up an armory for the Confederacy near Atlanta, Georgia. Now, land proved too expensive in Atlanta, so a site in Macon, Georgia, was selected when the city offered up the land free of charge. After getting settled in Macon in early 1862, production began on the guns and continued through the end of the war in 1865. When it came to the actual design of the revolvers they were making, the contract that they had specified that it be a Colt copy, most likely of the 1851 Navy variety. However, Burton overruled this stipulation and decided that the new Southern revolver should be based on the Whitney Navy. Yeah, where have we heard that before, right? Uh, he wanted it based on the Whitney Navy because of the reliability, the ease of manufacture, and the added strength of the solid frame with a top strap, which is also very similar to what you find on the, the, the Remington Model 1858. Now, despite the frame being made from brass, the guns were initially supposed to be electroplated in silver, which would give them an even closer appearance to that of the Whitney Navy. This idea was eventually scrapped, and most examples are found without plated brass frames. Like the Griswold and Gunnison design, the Spiller and Burr cylinder is also made of twisted iron. This ensures that any flaws in the bar iron they were using would not be in direct alignment with the cylinder chambers, helping to make it safer and less susceptible to failure. Total production was approximately 1,500 units, 
or only 10% of the very optimistic goal of 15,000 guns set out in their government contract negotiated by Burton. Moving on to the Columbus Firearms Manufacturing Company. This company was headquartered in Columbus, Georgia, and they had big plans that were never fully realized. On August 26, 1862, brothers Lewis and Elias Heyman were awarded a contract from the Confederate government for 10,000 revolvers based on the Colt 51 Navy. The brothers had been very successful. They had operated an ironworks that consisted of a foundry, machine shop, blacksmith shop with 30 forges, a large saddlery shop, and even a 30-horsepower engine. They were confident in their ability to make guns, and they had convinced the Confederacy in their ability to make guns, and so the Confederate government actually fronted them $50,000 in anticipation of the guns that they would produce. One week before the contract was awarded, an ad in the local paper noted that the shop was looking for 25 machinists, promising, quote, good wages and steady employment. By March 1863, another ad, which ran in a total of 13 papers, called for 100 additional gunsmiths and machinists. In May of 1863, the Montgomery, Georgia Weekly Advertiser called the Columbus Revolvers, quote, equal in every respect to the celebrated Colt pistols. Beyond this, however, little is known about the guns that were actually made there. Things seem to have gone very wrong very quickly at the small arms factory. Estimates suggest that no more than 100 of their revolvers were produced because the highest known serial number seems to be 94. Letters between the military officers in 1864 indicate that the company, which was now valued at $80,000, had been sold to the government by the Heyman brothers in the spring of that year. Shortages of raw material and equipment seemed to plague the manufacture of the guns. Production never took off under the Confederate government's control, and only a small batch of unknown quantity was manufactured in late March 1865, just a few weeks before General Lee surrendered. And that's really all we know about them. Another company we know little about is the Augusta Machine Works. Uh, this facility was in Augusta, Georgia, and the guns were based on what else but the Colt Model 51 Navy, and only a hundred or so of them were made between the three-year span of 1861 and 1864. There were two varieties, however, one with six stop slots on the cylinder and one with 12 stop slots on the cylinder. Both varieties feature one-piece wooden grips and a brown finish on all of the parts that were metal, except for the brass grip straps. The guns with 12 stop slots are rarer than those with six. Serial numbers on the guns, while very well marked in many places on known examples, are unusual in that they used both letters and numbers, which is, you know, kind of similar to what the Dance Brothers were using. Uh, not necessarily letters and numbers with them. They were numbers and shapes, but here we see letters and numbers. Features to look for if you're trying to identify one of these rare Atlanta Machine Works revolvers include the faint six-groove rifling with a slight right-hand twist, cylinders that measure 1 and 11 sixteenths inches in length, and frames that measure 3 and 3 sixteenths inch in length. And that's really all we have to go on about them. Not a whole lot known about the Atlanta Machine Works. The firm that we do know a bit more about is Leach & Rigdon. Now, Thomas Leach initially established himself as a cotton broker in Memphis, Tennessee, shortly before the Civil War. On August 29th, 1861, he took out an ad in the Memphis Appeal looking for 10,000 pounds of zinc, copper, and brass, quote, for military purposes. Less than three weeks later, another ad appeared, this time announcing that he would be taking orders for swords, sabers, cutlasses, knives, bayonets, bullet molds, and much more. By May of 1862, he had teamed up with Charles Rigdon, who was a maker of pharmacy scales, and they opened up what was known as the Memphis Novelty Works. Their first ad in the Memphis Appeal notes that their swords were being, being made in Columbus, Mississippi. Once the company officially relocated to Mississippi, the word Memphis was dropped from the name, and it was just known as the Novelty Works. It was at this time that the partners branched out and began making revolvers. When General Sherman continued to make his way south, Leach and Rigdon moved to Greensboro, Georgia, and purchased the Greensboro Steam Factory, where they resumed their operations. 
After securing a Confederate contract on March 6, 1863, the partners made copies of the Colt 51 Navy for only a few months until, for some reason, their partnership dissolved on December 13, 1863. This was not, however, the end of the company. The new partnership was formed uh, because Rigdon wasted no time in finding a new business partner. On January 27, 1864, the Augusta, Georgia Chronicle and Sentinel announced the formation of Rigdon Ansley and Company. This was Jesse A. Ansley, Andrew J. Smith, and Charles R. Keene who rounded out this new partnership with Charles Rigdon. This was essentially just a continuation of the Leach and Rigdon contract for the copies of Colt revolvers. It appears that Rigdon took all of the machinery with him and most all of the workmen when they opened the Georgia Ironworks. Serial numbers on the surviving examples indicate that the new partnership finished out the contract, which was for a total of about 1,500 revolvers. The main distinction between the two revolvers is marked basically just in the name that's on the guns. Uh, both varieties featured uh, one-piece walnut grips, blued barrels and cylinders, case hardened frames, and brass guards and back straps. So you really just have to look for the name difference on the guns in order to tell who was making what. So with that, we've now gone through, uh, what is it, uh, six or seven different firearm manufacturing firms for the Confederacy during the Civil War. Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, there's some we know more about, some we know less about, um, and this is all being based off of a wide variety of research and primary sources and books uh, that have been published over the last 60 or so years. A lot of the material originally came out during the centennial in the 1960s, but there has been uh, a great amount of research uh, in terms of published material over the years, as well as uh, newspaper documents that have been digitized and put online, which have been a great help for me in, in finding primary resources that weren't necessarily available when some of the original works were being done in the 1960s. So as you can see from the firms that we went through, there's a lot of different variety, a lot of different uh, ideas in what they were doing and why and where. And there was uh, a lot of issues that they came up against that we just didn't see uh, with arms makers in the North, and that's understandably so, given the way the war went. So with that, we're going to wrap up this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you did, please be sure to give us a review, share this with someone who you think might enjoy it, and we will be back right here next week with another episode. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Have a great day. <laughs>